morning. Thank you, Dr. Arthurs, for the kind introduction. He's very gracious. Imagine having your preaching professor sitting there in your congregation every other week. This morning, uh, I'm preaching a sermon on a passage that Crossbridge, the congregation that I lead, uh, went through this past summer. Now, we typically preach through whole books of the Bible because, as a graduate of Gordon Conwell, we've been trained really well. But periodically, we'll address certain topics. Uh, and this particular sermon series was on family and family relationships. But you might ask, as, as I asked when was wondering, why is there a sermon on friendship in a sermon series on family? That's a good question. I think for a lot of us, friends are family. Right? Maybe perhaps for some of you studying here at Gordon-Conwell, you don't have family here. You traveled from a different state, or, or maybe even further, from a different country, just to be here to further your education, to be equipped for ministry. And Thanksgiving is coming up, right? And coming up next week, and so perhaps some of you will be celebrating Thanksgiving or, or maybe Friendsgiving together. Our friends are our family. I mean, look no further than the, uh, the past nine Fast and Furious movies over the past 20 years. If some of you have watched those movies, family, I think, is mentioned at least 33 times. You see, these, these, uh, this set of characters, they're not all blood-related, but then you have Vin Diesel as Dominic Toretto as the patriarch of this makeshift family. Vin Diesel incredibly jacked in his jacked arms and his muscle tee with a Corona in one hand and the Dodge Charger behind him saying, no, I don't have friends, I got family. And then you cue the CU again song. So, so friendship is important in our culture, in our community, in our church. Many of us saw the importance of friendship and the need for friendship, particularly in the midst of COVID this, during this season, as Dr. Arthur's mentioned. Robin Dunbar, he's famous for his research on how humans form and maintain friendships and relationships. So he's probably best known for that Dunbar number, which some of you have heard about, the idea that, that human societies organizes itself into groups, but there's a limit to how many stable social relationships that one person can maintain. And so this Dunbar number basically states that, that due to maybe limitations on our brain structure or time, uh, we can only really maintain about 150 stable social relationships, people whom we would call friends. You know, of those 150 friends, there's a scaling of three. So that is that you know, we can really only maintain about five close, intimate friends. Beyond the five, you might add another 10 and have about 15 best friends. Then about 50 good friends, then 150 friends, and 500 acquaintances, and 1,500 people we know by name. Now, maybe those numbers have shifted a little bit with, uh, with social media and uh, all this technology. A few months ago, HBO Max released this highly anticipated Friends reunion special. I don't know how many of you have watched that. A, a show about six friends living together in New York City. And during that special, they interviewed all these different celebrities. And there was this one clip where BTS was sharing about the impact that friends had on their lives. Watching the show, friends apparently taught them English. Apparently, it also taught them the things about life and, quote unquote, true friendship. And so, we have Dunbar's number uh, of these different levels of friendship, stable social relationships that we can maintain. We have a show literally called Friends, centered around six friends, which have had a huge impact on pop culture and our society, and apparently taught a lot of people about friendship. But I think the Bible also has a lot to say about friendship. And that's what we find in our passage today. It's from Proverbs which is a wisdom book, wisdom literature, and you, wisdom, what is wisdom, right? Wisdom, I think according to one commentary, he puts it really well, is referred to the skill of living in the way of eternal life. The skill of living in the way of eternal life. So wisdom in the Bible is almost linked with this idea of righteousness, right? Sometimes they might even use it interchangeably. It talks about right living and right faith. 
And, and here in our passage, it's giving us wisdom about the kind of friendship that you and I, particularly as followers of Christ, ought to pursue. How we're to act as friends, which might be more, honestly, characteristic of the five or 15 friends that we have than with the 150 or 500. It's a friendship that maybe may or may not be different than the friendship that we see in Friends. Depends on which of the 236 episodes that we're talking about. Now we're going to be working through our passages today, two of them, Proverbs 27, 5 to 6 and Proverbs 17, 9. Both have to do with friendship and arguably what makes for a lasting friendship. Both passages deal with kind of sin that creeps up in friendship, whether it's a friend sinning against you or you sinning against them or just plain sinning. And here, here's the, the main point that we're going to see about friendship this morning. Lasting friendship, it's this. Cover over sin, but don't cover up sin. Cover over sin, but don't cover up sin. So if you have your Bibles or maybe your phones, you can turn with me, scroll with me to Proverbs 27, 5 to 6. We're going to start there. And what these two verses get at is that friendship needs frankness, not flattery. Friendship needs frankness, not flattery. So verse 5 opens with this contrast and maybe the seeming paradox, right? Better is open rebuke than hidden love. And so you have something that is open, completely open, fully disclosed out there, and you have something that is hidden. Now, we might expect that the passage would say better is open rebuke than hidden rebuke or hidden discipline, right? But he chooses to switch that word to love. Open rebuke, hidden love. And I think by comparing it this way, he's making the point that rebuke is a form of love. And maybe perhaps even that rebuke ought to be coming from a place of love. The friendship that this, uh, this proverb talks about is characterized by this frankness. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now he's comparing these two things and saying one is better than the other. Right? That, that friendship is shown through word and deed. So in this case, it's not the thought that counts. Instead, it is being brought out into the open. And we might specify what what is, though. You know, we're not talking about someone telling you, you know, your shoes don't match your shirt. You know, or we're talking about sin. We are, in fact, shining a light on sin. We are exposing it and revealing that sin for what it is. It is ugly. It is damaging. It is a hindrance to our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And this frankness, again, this open rebuke is coming from a place of love. One part sometimes that we fail to remember. And this is why I think the author writes that it's better than hidden love, because Hidden love is not helpful. So one commentator put it this way. Secret love is like winking at a girl in the dark. It does either her nor you any good. Now, admittedly, that's, that's a little bit dated, right? So I get the picture. I think you get the picture. But I'm not sure if people still wink uh, today. And if you're winking at someone who's not your significant other or your spouse, not sure how well they'll take it. So maybe we can try to, to modernize it a little bit just so that it hits a little bit closer at home. Hidden love, perhaps, maybe, is like typing up a whole text message about how you feel about them and then deleting it and, by, and then sending hey instead. Whether it's to your crush or a friend or more appropriately to someone you're actually in a, in a relationship with. Not saying anything does them nor you any good. Now, if you're not telling them or showing them your love expressed in words, what good is it? In our passage, makes the point that one of the ways to show love is open rebuke. Being frank, pointing that friend to Christ. And that is difficult for some of us to swallow. Especially when some of us don't like confrontation. When it's extremely uncomfortable for us to bring hard truths up. 
And that's because while open rebuke is a form of love when it comes from a place of love, it doesn't always feel loving. And I think verse 6, the next verse, acknowledges that. The passage continues, The faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Again, we see this contrast in what feels like a paradox. Wounds from a friend, kisses from an enemy. That's not what we might expect. But verse 6 is only further expounding on what we first read in verse 5. That, that word love in verse 5 and that word friend in verse 6, it's the same root. And so I think the author is drawing this connection between friend and love, which is shown as open rebuke. Basically, don't cover up sin. This connection then, I think, is also acknowledging the very awkwardness that we might feel when we need to point our friends, each other, to Christ. Because it is open, it is direct, and oftentimes it is severe. That is, you are making a wound. Metaphorically speaking, you are taking a knife and cutting into the flesh of your friend. It's not a fun experience for them. It's not a fun experience for you. At least I I hope it's not. But it needs to be done. Because you're not just cutting into that person for the sake of cutting. You're not simply just cutting them down. The purpose is to heal or restore something broken. I mean, that's what a surgeon does, right? Uh, something, sometimes to remove the cancer or to replace the heart, the surgeon has to make an incision into the flesh, cut into the flesh in order that what is diseased, what is broken, what does not belong can be healed, restored, or removed. And I think the intention, the motive, the purpose behind this wounding, wounding matters, right? It's not meant to destroy, but to restore. And I think that sets up a contrast with the second half of verse 6. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And so who does the wounding and who does the kissing makes a big difference. The wounds come from a friend and they're faithful. The kisses come from an enemy and they're deadly. The first image that pops up into my mind is of Judas. Judas. Right? Judas' literal kiss of betrayal when he sold Jesus out. I don't think any of us wants to be kissed under those circumstances. And so friendship needs frankness, not flattery. In uh, Shakespeare's King Lear, the king seeks out this false flattery, and it ends in his demise. He's unable to tell the difference between true feelings and false flattery. At the beginning of the play, he demands that his daughters declare how much they love him to test their loyalty. And so two of them cater to that demand. They provide him with this insincere love. One one tells him how much she adores him, how she would never disrespect him. Another lies and says she loves him with all her heart. But it's the third daughter, Cordelia, that refuses to just simply flatter him. Doesn't mean that she doesn't love him. But that's exactly how the king perceives it. And since it's a tragedy, it ends as such. Now, what difference does it make? Friendship needs frankness, not flattery. Now, as I mentioned before, it's hard for us, many of us, to do that. Our friend could be offending us or offending others or even just simply stumbling in sin. But we don't say anything. We don't want to make that incision or that wound. Or perhaps maybe sometimes we speak indirectly, right? We go around the issue. We avoid it altogether, perhaps. Or perhaps we we hope someone else will do the hard work of speaking the hard truth. At the same time, there might be all these things that we want to say, we ought to say. We're reminded that hidden love is not helpful. And neither is open rebuke, though, when it does not come from a place of love. Neither is open rebuke when it comes from a place of anger that is directed 
only at that individual, not even at the place of sin. When it's more about pointing fingers than it is about pointing friends to Christ. Now, have, you ever, have you ever had a friend tell you that you have like spinach or food in your teeth? It's, and it's embarrassing for a moment, but you're better off for it. Like imagine if I were preaching up here with food in my mouth, broadcasting to the entire world. Now, friends point out the spinach in our lives, right? They point out not just the stains on our shirt, but the, the stains on our soul. Because when we ignore the sin, the problem, it's like avoiding a broken leg. You know, can you imagine just walking around, hobbling around with a broken part of your body, trying to make it work, but ultimately harming yourself in the long run? The passage in Proverbs calls us to rebuke one another when we sin. And when, again, when we rebuke, it's not to point fingers, it's to point them to Christ. It's uncomfortable, but we're reminded we are doing it out of love. In fact, we are risking ourselves, right? We are risking ourselves in the interest of our friends, lest we become selfish or self-seeking or cowardly Christians. And so friendship needs frankness, not flattery. And it needs to be coming from a place of love, not hate, compassion, not indifference, grace, not self-righteousness. So scripture calls us not to cover up sin, but it also calls us to cover over sin. That is the second passage, Proverbs 17, 9. Cover over sins rather than uncovering old sins. So here we read, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. So what do you do when your friend offends you? When your friend sins against you, when a fellow church member does that. I think Jesus gives us a path for that in Matthew 18. It says there, if your brother sins against you, your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell him or her their fault between you and them alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell to the church. And if he refuses even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And so you go first to that brother or sister. Not in a public forum, not trying to make a spectacle, not dragging others into it simply to get them involved. And let's say by God's grace, your brother or sister repents. That's awesome. The motive here is future friendship, lasting friendship. We cover over an offense. We, we don't repeat the matter, which could mean some sort of gossip, is what the proverb might be talking about, covering over sins rather than uncovering old sins. How do we do that, though? There's a book uh, called When Sinners Say I Do, Discovering the Power of the Gospel for Marriage. And in one of the chapters, the author Dave Harvey is talking about forgiveness, costly and true forgiveness. And I think it has to do with covering over sin. Now, he's talking about marriage, which is extremely applicable for us, but, but I think it also applies to friendship. So after the offender acknowledges their sin and repents, what can the offended friend do? What can we do? Show mercy. He, he writes, he, he says here, it releases the person who sinned from the liability of suffering punishment for that sin. The one sinned against must lay down the temptation to say along with the unforgiving servant in Jesus' parable, pay what you owe. It shuts off the flow of bitterness by opening the flow of love. But there's another step. He says, the willingness of the one sinned against to absorb the cost of sin. Or you received emotional pain over what your brother or sister did. Will the pain end with you or will you return it? Will your heart attempt to, to force them to pay what they owe? 
or will you follow the footsteps of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and demonstrate a willingness to absorb that cost? True forgiveness, he says, sees another sin for the evil that it is, addresses it, then absorbs the cost of that sin by the power of God's abundant grace. And he cites another author saying that forgiveness can be a, a costly activity, right? When you cancel a debt, it doesn't just simply disappear. You absorb a liability. Again, re-emphasizing re this point. You're absorbing a liability that someone else deserves to pay. Similarly, forgiveness requires that you absorb certain effects of another person's sins. And you release that person from liability to punishment. This is precisely what Christ did for us on Calvary and how we're to emulate that in our friendships. Sometimes when we have broken friendships, it's because of things like this, when we're not able to absorb, when we continue to carry that bitterness, cover over sins, absorb the cost of those sins, and we do so, again, in view of Christ who took our sins to the cross, who in love absorbed the cost of our sins. Cover over sins, but don't cover up sins. I want to end this morning, this message, by praying a prayer that another pastor uh, online wrote for our pastor today. And it was just so rich and so good that I felt like yeah, I think it captures pretty well what needs to happen in our own hearts, perhaps this morning, for us to have lasting friendships. So I'm going to Read and pray this prayer, and I'm inviting you to pray with me and listen along. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, rarely does the phrase cover up do anything but raise suspicion, eyebrows, ire. Appropriately, we recoil when we experience the manipulation of facts, the minimization of harm, and the muting of our voices especially in the face of blatant injustice. To be either an agent or victim of this kind of cover-up is never okay. That being said, God, there's a stewardship of information, a way of handling one another's failures, sins, and weaknesses. That's a delicate art and requires a gospel heart. There is such a thing as a gospel cover-up. And I, we, your children want to be much better at it. So as we meditate on this scripture, your word this morning, here's our confession and our prayers. Forgive me when I choose to uncover and use old offenses against my spouse, my children, or my friends, just to win an argument, gain an advantage, or minimize my own sin. It's as though I never really forgave them the first time. Forgive me, God, when I repeat someone else's, someone's offense to another friend or a number of friends under the guise of seeking prayer when in reality I'm just gossiping, perhaps even slandering people I claim to care about. How insecure, insecure and insidious is that? Forgive me, God, when I keep uncovered and constantly rehearse the sins and offenses of others to myself feeding my self-righteousness, feeling my mannish anger, and fermenting my desire for revenge. How ugly is that? Forgive me, Lord, when I constantly repeat my own failures to myself, choosing to indulge my self-contempt and the accusations of Satan much more than I believe and relish the gospel. What a destructive way to do life robbing you of much glory. Jesus, you are the greatest promoter of love ever. For by your blood, you have once and for all covered up, covered over, and carried away my sins forever. You will not, no ever, never, repeat my foolish, fiendish, fickle matters to me or anyone else. How I praise you today for your irrepressible love for me. And so we ask, God, that you would continue to change our hearts, channel 
our words by your grace for your glory and the good of others. We pray this in your holy and kind name. Amen.